Hello, you're watching Talking Europe. Competitiveness is a Brussels buzzword and a key aspect of making the EU compete better with its global rivals is boosting science, research and innovation. My guest today has been in Paris to discuss that very topic at a conference hosted by the French government. Roxana Munzato, Executive Vice President of the European Commission, is in charge of social rights and skills, quality jobs and preparedness. Preparedness. She held various posts in the Romanian government, including Minister of European Funds and Secretary of State at the Ministry of European Investments and Projects. She was also a member of the Romanian Parliament for the Social Democratic Party. Welcome to the programme, Commissioner. Thank you so much for having me. So, the European Commission has announced this 500 million euro incentive package to support science research in the EU and to attract American scientists to Europe. Uh, why do you believe that this is now a key moment to try to attract this kind of talent to the EU? Look, there was a package presented by President von der Leyen, a half a billion euro package to support scientists and scientists' careers in Europe. It's not necessarily to attract, you know, Indian or American scientists. It's to make Europe the destination of choice in terms of innovation, of research. And that means investing in the activity, uh, in the uh, necessary, uh, say, uh, resources that the scientists and innovators would require here in Europe. And why now? Well, we are living turbulent times, that is for sure. And we see this geopolitically, and we understand also the need that the continent, need, uh, that Europe has, not only to position itself in relation to the USA, to China, to other parts of the world, but we are also a continent that, whose productivity is starting to decrease. A continent that is aging, a continent that needs innovation like the air that it breathes. But we need to put our money where our words are. So we need to start with investment. We'll come back to the question of funding, but uh, one of the big barriers to creating this kind of European science, science market is the fragmentation we've seen in the sector. That was highlighted in Enrico Letta's report. It was echoed in Mario Draghi's report. There are a lot of barriers even within the EU still. So how would you try to deal with that? This is the situation with many of the policies that we are trying to uh, make stronger in Europe. We will also work, uh, legally speaking, at EU level on the European research area, which should be a unified market where we can allow for the free circulation of, of knowledge in the same way that we allow for the free circulation of goods, of capitals, of persons, of skills as well, because I'm in charge of skills and we can talk about circulation of skills as well, because it's equally important. So we really need to invest Invest. We need to have a stronger market, let's say, an area of, of, of research that is not hindered by barriers. This requires political commitment, and it's important that we launched in France uh, in the presence also of President Macron. So it's important that member states also uh, engage in this direction, and we want to work strongly and, and closely with member states to create this High res um, this research and high education area where we are able to, to strengthen our ties. I believe that for both education, quality education in Europe that will be champion globally, but also for good, brilliant research, we need strong universities and strong research centers. All of this requires funding, and of course, uh, your boss, Ursula von der Leyen, has said that she'd like to see EU member states spend 3% of their G GDP on research and development by 2030. And yet, look at France, paradoxically, right? France was the host of this conference, and yet here, the higher education and research budget has been cut by several hundred million euros. That doesn't send the kind of signal that you're looking for. True, and indeed, each member state has its own fiscal policies, its own fiscal tableau, its own adjustments that it needs to do, and its own issues with deficits, with income, with revenue. With but beyond, you know, the the financial and fiscal management of of each member state, we really need to understand that it's the time to prioritize those policies that will fuel our economic growth 
growth and will bring more money to our budgets and will make Europe stronger and its economy more uh, autonomous in relation, less vulnerable to, to the outside world. So this is very important. Without innovation, without being able to create new products, new services, if you're constantly a consumer, a buyer of products and services that are launched from other competitors, then you cannot be stronger and then your budgets will never grow stronger. I want to talk a bit about um, skills because you're leading work on what's being called the Union of Skills. Uh, we know that an estimated 94 million European workers will have to retrain uh, by 2030 because of automation. That was a major study done by McKinsey. Uh, how do you see the retraining then of so many people? What should happen? So I'm the Commissioner for Education and Skills, and indeed we launched the Union of Skills on the 5th of March as a policy that, you know, it's more that about giving solutions to skilling and reskilling and upskilling workers in face of automation or in face of different, you know, transformations, restructuring of the industries. In the Union of Skills, we have four pillars. We propose uh, solutions to improve the basic skills of children, for example. Children who are failing on basic levels in maths will not be able to reskill for automation. Of course, we have to intervene for adults as well, and we need to work at their basic skills. But to go back to your question, yes, one of the main pillars of the Union of Skills is about workplace learning. And we propose, uh, for example, a skills guarantee for workers. We will pilot it in the beginning this year and next year with a limited amount of money to see how we can work with industries, with social partners, with governments. Uh, we can, how we can uh, invest in the training of workers in companies that are restructuring so that we make sure that they can face uh, a new job where they are assisted by AI or where their job description changes a bit in the same company or a similar job, or they can transition to a similar industry. And we have had these strategic dialogues with crucial uh, uh, industries, automotive, and we're talking now with defense, mm -hmm. such you know industries where you have these technical STEM skills, uh, engineering, technicians, which can transition, that we have this skills guarantee for workers scale up after we pilot it in such a way that it will become a bit of a right to train, which we talk about a lot in Brussels, that workers have a right to train, a right to reskill, to upskill. I want to ask you about uh, the quality jobs roadmap that you're also in charge of, because, of course, the idea is to have uh, quality jobs for all. And yet we do have these quite alarming statistics from Eurostat about youth unemployment. In March 2025, youth unemployment across the EU was 14.5 percent. That is a lot higher than the overall rate of 5.8 percent. Why do you think there is this particular problem with young people being unemployed and what can you do to change that? Indeed, young people, women, Roma popula population, there are several sectors where we see critical unemployment. And with young people, for example, we, we are trying to improve our tools, in, including investing in traineeships. For example, we do support uh, through the EU funds, through the Youth Guarantee, uh, uh, traineeships uh, for young people to, to start their career in the company. But we also work, legally speaking, on a proposal for a directive regarding the quality of trainees. Of course, it's still being debated between Council and, and Parliament, but, but it's important that you know that we want to tackle even this, the level of quality of traineeships, because young people nowadays, of course, they want to start their, their work uh, with practical experience, not just theoretical experience, but also they have to be, you know, their health, their safety, their remuneration have to be respected. And we have many cases of young trainees whose, you know, uh, um, um, activity and efforts are not treated uh, as such. They are being many times exploited, you know, free labor, free work, and we deal with this as well. But beyond that, we also, again, need to understand what is going wrong also in our education system. Young people are, of course, critically unemployed, uh, more so than other categories. But we see since 2012 until present how in maths, in reading, in literacy overall, in digital, their basic achievement, their minimal competence is slowly decreasing, making us very vulnerable in relation to, to other competitors. Because companies start to say, look, when we choose other destinations to invest, it's no longer about the cheapest 
let's say, resources or, or human capital. It's about the availability of quality, talented, skilled labor, skilled people. Uh, we want to invest and to work with member states to really make this a political top priority, investing in skills, education for the younger generation and for the adults alike. What about the impact of social media on, on young people? Do you think that's part of these trends that you've just described, for oh. example, what we saw with TikTok in Romania in the last in few Romania, months? In I've, Romania, I've worked uh, before I, I was elected in the European Parliament on the water and wastewater sector, where we, ha we have huge shortages of engineers, of specialists, and I went into universities and high schools to discuss with the young generation. Uh, do you want to study, you know, uh, to become a, a, um, an engineer in water systems or a technician? And they didn't. They applied for, for, for college and then they abandoned the, the, the university studies. And I said, why? Oh, but it's so much easier to be an influencer, to do vlogging on YouTube and this. Very difficult. Oh, it's complicated to do the technical university, even though it's very digital. So. Uh, that being said, I think that we need also to, to create this, uh, first of all, uh, motivation of, of the young generation and of all workers to go towards certain careers, and that means quality jobs. That means that it's not just the salary, but it's also the uh, health, safety, work-life balance, the quality of the working environment, uh, how well um, valued you are as a worker as well. Uh, and it is also about a bit more than that. You've asked me about disinformation, misinformation, social media. Uh, I think we need to tackle this skill of being able to be a citizen in a very digitalized world differently. We proposed in the Union of Skills the fifth basic skill. So we have literacy, math, science, digital. The fifth is citizenship uh, basic skill, where we are showing that we need, together again with schools, with educators, to teach our young generations and adults alike, what it is to have critical thinking, how to face disinformation, misinformation, how to spot uh, fake news. So this fifth basic skill is also a tool that we put forward to the member states and we want to invest in it so that we defend and make our citizens stronger, not just stronger workers, but stronger citizens in democracies. We'll, let, we'll end it there. Thank you so much for being my guest, uh, Roxana Munzato, Executive Vice President of the European Commission. Glad you could join us for this interview here on Talking Europe.